Thank you all for joining us for the Giving Great Virtual Presentations Workshop. Joining us today is Sarah Schiffman, Lecturer and Course Director in the Department of Communication Studies. She's going to be discussing uh, tips and strategies on how to improve the quality of our virtual presentations and to engage our audience. So I'm going to hand it over to her to get us started. Thank you. Thanks so much, Navina, and thank you everyone for being here today. I'm excited to share with you um, a few of the principles that uh, not only I, that I teach or that uh, occur in COM 101, um, but principles that I know to work from my own professional uh, experiences. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen and I will start the uh, PowerPoint presentation. At any time, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to raise your hand um, using the, the function in WebEx here or simply type in the chat. Um, Nevin is going to help me kind of uh, moderate some of those questions, but I will also um, pause in between relevant sections and ask if there's any questions or comments. I usually like to get some feedback and some conversation going, so don't be shy. Feel free to reach out. I'm going to share my screen. And I will start presenting and move my window pane around for a second. So thank you for bearing with me. Okay. As Nevena mentioned, today we're talking about giving virtual presentations, and there has never been a time where this is more relevant. I recall when we totally overhauled COM 101, we started to talk about for the first time, how do you effectively communicate using technological platforms? And now that we are in 2020 and we have COVID and everything is remote, these skills are more important now than ever. And I think that these skills will remain very important as we move into the future. So I'm Sarah Schiffman. Um, a little bit about me before we get started. I'm the course director for COM 101, and I'm also a lecturer in the Communication Studies Department. Um, I graduated from UNLV in my undergrad and bachelor, or bachelor's and master's. Um, so go Rebels. I also have worked as a professional mediator for the Clark County Family Court and the Nevada Supreme Court, as well as um, in marketing roles on the Strip. And I am also a part-time communication consultant as well for organizations. So before we get started, um, let's talk a little bit about exactly what we hope to glean from today's presentation. So first, we want to better understand protocols and etiquette that will help you manage virtual communication. Also, obtain some tips to improve the quality of your physical surroundings and your presentation style and then learn how to engage your audience on virtual platforms. What I like to say about the world of virtual communication is that this is a skill, just as it's a skill to engage people in person, it is a skill set to engage people virtually. And because it's a skill set and because these are things that we can learn, the power is really in our hands to get more information, um, to practice with some of the principles and to really improve our communication styles virtually. Um, that will pay off a lot in terms of your academic endeavors, but also your professional endeavors, civic endeavors. So um, before we get started with the protocols and etiquette for virtual communication, there's a couple of themes that I want to just point out right away. You'll notice that some of the things that we keep going back to time and time again are these ideas of practice and preparation. And just like you have to prepare and practice in when you're giving a speech in person, there's no difference in terms of a virtual presentation. There's also the idea of everything that we do should enhance our message instead of detracting from our message. So really being aware of exactly what we're doing and making our actions in every way that we can intentional versus unintentional. So those are the three real highlights that I think kind of run through and uh, provide some cohesion with the tips that we're going to talk about today. Practice and preparation, enhancing your message instead of detracting, and um, intentional versus unintentional gestures. So how many of you uh, in this new world of remote learning and teaching and presenting um, have encountered painful virtual presentations or encounters? Couple of head nods, couple of 
hands raised, you can, oh, me, yes. Feel free to, to chat, feel free to turn on your camera. What have been some of the themes that you can say have been a little painful in the world of virtual communication or presentations? Not being able to see the audience. Yes, that's a big one. Sometimes you feel like you're just speaking into a void. Um, I feel a little bit like that now without um, without folks having their cameras turned on, but um, that's also fine for the workshop today, if that's your preference. Um, we have another chat that I can't get to at the moment. Um, oh, uh, technological issues on the speaker's behalf. Yes, it's so painful. Um, have you ever seen that one uh, internet meme where it's like a, a conference call, but in person? I'm here. Are you there? The host is joining. Can you hear me? We're freezing. So uh, disruptive, right? And we had a comment from Jess when the or uh, when the speaker is not organized, uh, right? So that really goes back to this idea of preparation and practice. As presenters, we have a certain obligation to respect our audience's time, and that goes back to the preparation and practice that we're going to talk about a lot today. Any other painful themes that y'all have endured in this world of virtual presentations or communication? When someone unmutes while you're talking, yes, that's a big one these days, right? So we want to be sure that we're respectful of the person who's speaking, that we mute our own microphones, and that we're just aware of, of how to do that, right? We have a lot of even K through 12 students um, in our community who are learning exactly how to mute and unmute in a seamless way. But again, that goes back to the idea, I think, of preparation and practice. Thanks everyone so much for sharing. So let's get into the first main point here when we think about etiquette for managing the uh, virtual communication. So getting the lighting right is incredibly important. And I think living in such a bright place uh, in the desert, we really need to be mindful of exactly where our light source is coming in. So you may have a window that you're working nearby. Um, you may have a certain level of control over where you can do your virtual presentations or your, your online remote uh, work. But you really want to think about, you know, can I relocate? Is there a better space? What kind of natural light occurs in this space? Space. What kind of light do I have in the space in terms of, you know, uh, just ceiling lighting or lamp lighting? The goal for getting the light right is really to have your face clearly seen. We'll see through this presentation how much it matters to have your face be accessible. And as human beings, we want to see each other's face. We want to be able to see our um, gestures, our, our nonverbals. So it's really important that you get the lighting just right. One way that you can do this is to make sure that you have a great light source just above your camera. So if you have a lamp, for example, um, you could place it sort of adjacent to your camera and have that light source be shining, but just make sure you're not backlit so we can't see your face. Make sure that you're not side lit or front lit. You really want that light source occurring right here over the camera so that you're well lit and we can see your face. Um, you're also, you'll also want to think about your background or the space in which you are doing your presentation. Background matters a lot. And when we think about intentional versus unintentional, uh, sort of uh, behavior um, or surroundings, this one comes into play a great deal. So think about where you have, what you have in your space, what kind of space you have and where you can get the cleanest background that will not detract from your message, right? Sometimes when I see virtual presentations and someone has a lot of things going on or their closets in the background or their awards or certificates are there, I'm sort of, you know, natural human uh, instinct, what's that? Oh, first place in the swimming competition, like way to go. So you don't want to have your audience trying to pick out what's in the background. You really want them to be focused on you and your message first. If you don't have a clean place, if you don't have a clean background, utilize some of those really great um, backgrounds that WebEx or Zoom has in their repository. Just make sure it's something appropriate, right? If you're having a, pr a professional presentation, probably don't pick the beach background. Maybe pick something like a clean office or even a uh, dark background um, if you if you can. 
Also, you'll want to know the technology that you're working with. Some of you are becoming very familiar with platforms like WebEx, it's the university supported platform, um, or platforms like Zoom or Google Meet. Be sure that whatever the platform is that you choose, you know the ins and outs of it and you know how to operate it. If you don't have a choice, then you'll need to spend some time and you're not familiar, you'll need to spend some time there figuring out exactly how to operate that technological platform, right? How do I share my screen? How do I look at the chat function? How do I know if someone has raised their hand? All of those things matter so that it's not a clunky, uh, you know, presentation that is distracting. We want something that's seamless and that practice comes into play. Then also play to the camera. So when you're speaking, you want to make the camera your best friend, really. And sometimes I like to think about the camera as someone that you like or you love, right? Someone that you really want to look at, that you really want to talk to, that you have that sort of emotional quality towards and that you're engaging with. So when we think about public speaking, for example, or any kind of presentation in, per in person, one of the most important aspects of nonverbal delivery is eye contact. Right? Eyes are really the window to the soul. We want to see other humans' eyes. That's how we engage. So when you think about where you're looking, you want to be looking at the camera like 80% of the time in your presentation. Of course, you can look away briefly to get your notes, but you don't, you never want to completely turn away and go from go away from your audience, right? That doesn't feel great to your audience members. You want to stay engaged play to that camera, look straight into the camera, and really watch where you're looking in terms of, am I looking at my own feedback? Uh, that's a real tempting one for us to do. You know, we sort of tend to just look at ourselves when we speak or even look at our, I call it a Brady pain. So we look at all of our uh, meeting participants and we're looking at them. If you, if you need to do that, if you can't resist, move it just below your camera so that your eyes are still in the same area and you're not talking down here. See how different that feels when I'm talking down to the corner of my screen versus talking to you into the camera. Big difference. And it's an easy way to engage your audience. You want to also think about placement of your camera. So you don't want to be, your camera shouldn't be underneath you so that it's sort of up your nostrils or down, so it's looking down on the top of your head. You really want to get your camera in your eye line, so parallel to your eye line, and you want to try to frame yourself in a way that your shoulders are visible, your hands are visible, your face are visible, and that you have a, just a small amount of space at the top of your head, so you're nicely framed in the shot looking at that camera and having that gaze parallel. So keep your camera parallel to your eye line. And then get close, but not too close, right? Um, we don't need to see every single detail of your face, but also it, it doesn't allow us to see your gestures or your posture, right? Um, and we also don't wanna be too, too far away because then it feels like I'm not present in the presentation and I'm way far away from the information and my audience. So get close, but don't get too close. So find that sweet spot where you can have your shoulders and your head all framed into the shot. More protocols and etiquette for managing online communication. One really great tip if you are the presenter is to stand up when you present. If you think about the energy that you have when you sit down versus when you're standing up, it's the difference between feeling a little more passive versus active in your own presentation. So let's note that presentations are always about the speaker. The speaker is first and foremost and then the message, right? So if you stand up, it provides that energy and it provides that engagement that you would have in a face-to-face -face setting, right? So it sort of communicates, I'm engaged, I'm ready. And if you're communicating to your audience, I'm engaged, I'm ready, I have a certain level of energy here, that is contagious to your audience. So you wanna be sure that you're bringing the same energy to your presentation that you want from your audience members, right? You don't wanna lose anybody, you don't want the whole crowd to go to sleep. So standing up is a great way to achieve that. And you'll have to play around with stacking books or you know, getting things to get your camera up to that eye level, um, but it really is a beneficial uh, thing to do for your delivery and engagement. 
You also want to think about being animated. Sometimes this is hard if we're nervous and we have communication apprehension and we have cortisol, for example, uh, or, or um, uh, adrenaline pumping through our, our veins. Sometimes it's hard and we just sort of get small and we clam up and we sort of, you know, uh, shrivel up and, and, and close ourselves off. You really want to think about owning your space about using gestures appropriately, um, about matching what you're saying to your uh, nonverbal delivery and having some animation because it communicates we're engaged, we're involved, and that again is contagious. Um, so think about ways that you can be intentional in your animation, your gestures, plan them out, practice with them. A great way to practice uh, in this digital world is to simply record yourself and then watch it back and take notes for these things that we're talking about and try to make changes as you see fit for that most effective delivery for that um, enhancing your message, not detracting. Also pace yourself again when we're nervous that cortisol is pumping, we tend to speed up, right? But when you speak too fast, you start to lose your audience. You want to be sure that your tempo, your pace is right in the sweet spot so that your audience can hear what you're saying and not get distracted by, whoa, this person's talking way too fast. I don't know what they're saying. What's going on? That's what your audience is thinking about instead of your message. So be sure that you pace yourself again, practice pacing, record yourself, listen to it back. Generally at the moment of speaking, if it sounds like just a bit too slow to you in your head, you're just right for your audience. So think about how you pace your presentation as well. So part of the preparation uh, to avoid some of those really annoying technological problems or that lack of preparation is to prior to your uh, presentation is to do a sound check. You need to be sure that whatever the microphone is that you have, whether it's in your computer or whether you use uh, earbuds or earbuds or an external microphone, you want to test that out and be sure that the sound is clear and not distracting. Sometimes they can sound muffled or cracky and that again detracts from your message and makes for a frustrated audience, which is not where we want our audience to be ever. So sometimes, uh, especially you know now where everyone's online, we have bandwidth issues, and um, we can we see that Wi-Fi isn't always this. It's not always strong, right? Sometimes it comes in and out, and this can be very frustrating. If your Wi-Fi cannot keep up. Um, or just to be completely safe, think about using an Ethernet cable and plugging into your modem. That is the single fastest way to get your Wi-Fi to work for you and to avoid those freezes or those delays in your presentation that we know are so irritating. Okay, so more protocols um, and etiquette. You want to incorporate redundant systems and what this means basically is that you have a backup plan so there's a there's a law that is if something will fail if it can't fail, it will right so we want to think about all the ways that we back up our presentation if we have an outline if we have slides make sure that you're saving it in multiple ways so that you can access it and you don't have a snafu right before you go to present that's incredibly stressful it derails you from what you're about to do and it just diverts your attention elsewhere and it's not the best way to start your presentation. So think about different ways that you can save your files, backups that you can have. I always have a paper copy with me so that I know exactly where I'm at and I know that if something fails, I can rely on my uh, paper outlines or my paper slides to help me in the uh, event of a technological snafu. Um, also, we want to think about how we engage our participants. So um, just as you are in an in-person presentation, you want to think about the ways that you can translate that engagement and those techniques in a virtual world, right? There really is nothing that we cannot do in a virtual world. It just might be a matter of figuring out how we achieve it in an online setting or a virtual setting. Um, so think about the ways that you can ask your audience questions, right? We know that our audience has a really short attention span. In fact, most of you are probably starting to gaze off and close off from exactly what I'm saying. Um, but about five to 10 minutes in of one speaker, we know that the research is very clear that audiences start to um, 
uh, stop paying attention. So how do we engage them? You can stop, you can ask questions, you can see uh, if there's any places for clarification or places that people can add to what you're saying or provide examples. You can use a polling system like a Kahoot. Um, you could engage in a little uh, a quiz or an activity a short one, depending on how much time you have. You can also ask your participants to do a think, pair, share. This is a great way to get your audience members engaging with one another, talking about ideas, and then reflecting that back um, when they go to report on the open-ended question that you have asked in that think, pair, share. And they can really provide something that's valuable because they've had a chance to talk to someone else and you know, collaborate with ideas, and then someone uh, pr basically presents from their group uh, what they found out. You can also have someone who's like a moderator or a host or a co-producer almost. So think about someone you might be able to into your presentation to help you manage some of the dynamic things that happen in presentations, like people raising their hand virtually, like people not muting or unmuting their mics, uh, people who uh, type into the chat as you're talking, you might get so into it and so in the flow that you don't see that you have a bunch of questions that people have been asked, uh, they're asking of you. So uh, see if you can have almost a co-producer to help you kind of navigate some of those technological issues um, and places where your attention is being pulled so that you can have a seamless presentation. So evaluating and enhance speaks to the idea of that preparation and practice. Again, record yourself. Go ahead and look at what you see in that video file. Make some notes of areas where you have room for improvement. Make notes for areas that you're doing well and adjust accordingly. Feedback is so important. And just as we've learned to speak to people face to face, we have to learn how to speak to people virtually. And that just takes time. So be gentle with yourself and uh, take that feedback and incorporate it as you can. And finally, be yourself and have fun. I cannot stress this enough, right? Sometimes uh, the, the nerves and the anxiety of presenting overwhelms us and we don't have a chance to let our personality shine through, to let our passions shine through, or to have fun with the presentation. But really, that's what audiences want to see from you. You'll have more fun, they'll have more fun, they'll be more engaged. And I always say, better to be a first-rate version of yourself than a second rate version of someone else. Meaning, be yourself, right? Engage in presentation techniques that you know work for you and that you're comfortable with. Don't try to just mimic something that you might've seen that you think is effective. The audience really wants to know who you are. They wanna get a glimpse into, into you. So let your audience see that and, and try your best to have some fun with the presentation. Another thing that I always mention about presentations is that, you know, sometimes it can feel overwhelming, more like a performance, but really think about the fact that you're giving your audience a gift. It's a gift and it's the gift of knowledge, right? It's, it's, it's an exchange of ideas. So if you frame it that way, it may, it might feel a little uh, less daunting than if you view it as a performance. Questions. I blank out and freeze when I get nervous. That's very, yeah, very normal. <laughs> very normal. Um, should I write out a script word for word? Great question, uh, Nirvana. Thank you so much. So part of preparation and practice, um, in terms of writing for the ear instead of writing for the eye, meaning you're not writing for readers, you're writing for listeners, it needs to be really well thought out. And, and what I mean by that is really organized and highly structured, fairly repetitive. Uh, we know that folks um, have a tendency to stop li listening after a short period of time. So we really wanna be sure that our audience understands where we're at in the presentation, what we're saying, that we're organized with our ideas and we give them plenty of places to follow along with us. So what you should do when you think about giving a presentation, and this is such a great question, um, instead of starting with your visual aid, most folks just start making slides. And, and really you wanna turn this uh, backwards. Your slides come last. What you should start with first is an outline. 
So this sounds like it's more work, but trust me, this will streamline everything. This will let you uh, get involved in the preparation and practice of your ideas so that it, when it comes time for presentations, you're just able to go right in to your material and you know what you're talking about because you've spent time working in that outline, right? And getting familiar with your ideas and supporting your ideas and organizing your ideas. So what you first want to look at is creating a preparation outline and usually it should have three parts, an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. So the introduction is there to really set up your topic, introduce your topic, introduce you as a speaker, uh, provide that audience relevancy. Then in your body of your presentation, you should aim to have about three sort of buckets or main points that are like ideas um, or concepts that you wanna unpack. So you really start with those, uh, those main points and then you support those things uh, with your sub points. And then you want to be sure that you're transitioning between each se uh, section. So in between the intro of the body, the body conclusion, and every main point in the body. So a transition would sound something like it's a review and a preview. So now that we've seen uh, about some of the protocols and etiquette for managing virtual communication, let's look at What's my next section? Uh, physical surroundings and presentation style. Um, so you want to really flesh out those ideas. It should not be a script. It should just be all your ideas that you mean to say all worked out in an outline so that you know exactly what section you're in and, and what you're talking about. And then you can pare that down to a speaking outline. So recall that you never want to read to your audience. If I was sitting here reading off my notes instead of looking at the camera and talking to you in a conversational ma manner, you would be less engaged as an audience. We really don't wanna be read to as an audience. So you wanna have that extemporaneous style speaking or conversational style speaking. So that's where the preparation and practice, that's where that preparation outline, then reducing that preparation outline into a speaking outline, which is a very reduced version of that prep outline. So just in case you get off track, you can refer back to that outline, but you never wanna write out scripts. It's really about developing ideas on paper and then practicing those ideas out loud a bunch of times before you go to actually present. Um, how do you work around awkward silence? That's a great one. And there, there, is, a, there is a little bullet coming up about this exact um, idea. Um, pausing and silence doesn't have to be awkward. And in fact, pausing and silence is really important. If you think about all the uses for pauses and, and the ways that you can make that highlight material or signify importance. Um, use those pauses in your favor, right? You can you can make some more drama or highlight importance by by just saying nothing and giving a few moments to your audience to just be in silence. It's powerful, right? But if you are presenting and you're asking your audience an open-ended question, you really want that engagement, you're gonna have to have that same sort of patience and just sitting in the discomfort of that silence and really giving them an opportunity to say something back. If you just pause and your audience sees you're not gonna go on till someone says something, generally they'll contribute. Somebody will say something somewhere. So you just sort of have to, you know, stand stand by your ideas and, and just sit there in silence and wait. If you if it's becoming a really long time, and of course we want to be mindful of time limits in present in presenting, it's so important that we don't go way over the time given to us. Um, but if you think about like this is going on too long, I really need someone to respond, then you want to try asking your question in a different way. And usually open-ended questions are the best way to get some responses. So open-ended questions are questions that cannot be answered with a yes or a no. It's also really helpful to ask people about their own experiences. Generally, people have opinions about things. So you can think about, oh, how can I ask a question maybe about something they might have experienced or common problems that we've all faced. But it's really just about being comfortable in silence and uh, being creative in drawing that uh, information out of your audience in different ways if necessary. When you're standing to present, yes. When you're standing, uh, thank you so much, Nicole. So when you're standing to present, um, you can have waist up. 
Uh, but you want to be sure that the audience can still see your face and can still see your gestures. You're still nicely framed in that shot. You could you could have from your chest up, no doubt, when you stand up. So either waist up or chest up when you are uh, speaking and you're standing up to present. But be sure that you take a look at what that looks like and that you make sure that your audience can see the details of your face and at least your eye contact. Where are you looking, right? Great question. Thanks, Nicole. Any other questions? What questions do you have? Ask me a question. Okay. Nothing, that's fine. Uh, we have a lot more to cover, so I'm gonna continue to move on here. Check my time. Okay, so physical surroundings um, and presentation styles. So we've covered some of this, but let's um, talk a little bit more about the specifics. So being brief means that you realize that audiences really don't have the uh, capacity to, to listen to every single thing you're saying beyond that 10 minute mark and finding ways to creatively build in those breaks, you know, whether that's a question or whether that's uh, a silence, um, something like that. But you want to be sure that you're being very brief. Um, and that you're keeping things simple. So in, again, in presentations or oral communication, it's really uh, hard for audiences to uh, pay attention for a long period of time, but also pay attention to a lot of complex ideas in one sitting. So you wanna be sure that what you're saying is simple, um, but also that your visual aid or your slides are really simple as well. The research is very clear that like cognitively we can not pay attention to a speaker speaking and a bunch of text on a slide at the same time. It's really one or the other. And remember that presentations are never about the PowerPoint. They're always about the speaker. That PowerPoint is only there to enhance your message, to provide clarity. So that's why we don't start with crafting the visual aid first. We start with the preparation outline. And then once we've got that preparation outline all uh, situated, we practice. Then we employ the visual aid. Then we start thinking about creating that visual aid after. So you look at places in your presentation or your talk that might be difficult to understand, that may be a little bit dry. Those are the places where you want to bring your ideas to life using a visual aid. So dry, complex areas of your speech, you, you look at that first and then that's when you use your visual aid. But remember to keep your visual aid simple. We've all endured death by PowerPoint. We've all endured basically a script written out on a visual aid where a presenter is, re then what's the point of the presenter if you do that, right? Where, where do you add value if you're just putting your script up on a PowerPoint and reading off of it for your audience? You could just send them the PowerPoint and save everybody the hour's time, right? So make sure that you are only putting in there, you know, very brief, just like I have here. So this is really the, like the best principle, best practices in, in using visual aids or slides specifically. You want to think about what is the largest thing on my slide? Generally, templates force you to have your title be the largest thing on your slide, but how often is that title really the most important thing on your slide? Usually it's not the most important thing on your slide. So you want to think about the size of your information. I make this, the things that are most important, the biggest in uh, on my, my slide. You also want to think about your background and having a dark background with light text. That's what's really appealing to our eyes. It's easy to understand. So you want to have that dark background, light keep everything very clean, no fancy fonts really, uh, not a ton of pictures. We just simply cannot absorb all of these things while listening to a speaker. You wanna also think about the fact that it's about seven items per slide. So one slide should represent, your, your one slide should represent one idea. And in that slide, you're unpacking that one idea using no more than like seven things, whether that's text, or, or images, and, and really the best combination is text, 
with one image and no more than that, right? So think about seven objects on your slide. And when I say objects, I mean, I mean the title, I mean the bullet points, and then I mean the uh, image that you include. So really push yourself to pare down your slides always. How much can I delete? And if you're worried that your audience will be mad dash to take notes and, and they won't have all the information that you're saying, just give them your outline. And that's what I'm going to do for each of you today. I will provide you with my PowerPoint and then I will provide you with the outline that basically summarizes what I'm verbally telling you now. So, sorry, I should have said that before. Don't feel like you have to mad dash to, to make all these notes. I'll, I'll provide you with a complete outline that unpacks everything I'm saying as well. Okay, so be a TV personality. Think about how and start paying attention to how people who are really engaging and dynamic, whether that's on TV or through the computer screen, think about how they are engaging. Think about how they, they really face the, the, the camera with confidence. They've practiced and they've prepared. They're using those natural gestures, but planned and intentional gestures to really engage with their audience. And they have that sort of confidence about them. Now, if you don't feel confident, just know that the only way to gain confidence is by doing it. So every single time that you speak to a camera, every single time that you present, you are gaining skills towards becoming more capable and comfortable um, in that in the in the area. Uh, okay, so let's see. Be standing. So again, we talked about this. It just changes the energy level. It uh, engages your audience a little bit more. Um, and be prepared. Again, it takes some time to outline your ideas uh, and make sure that you like what you've outlined, then to create your you know, preparation outline and your speaking outline. And then after that, to create your slides and then to practice all of that. That takes some time. So just know that a good presentation is an investment in your time and effort. But that will really pay off because instead of not preparing and feeling totally nervous and like a nervous wreck, uh, you'll go to present and you will feel a lot more confident because you've invested that time and that energy in making your presentation great. So be prepared. So, you know, utilize that technological platform, record yourself, think about developing your ideas in an outline and then make your visual aid last and then practice. Practice all of those things together. Practice your delivery. Practice how you organize your ideas. Practice how you're going to move through your slides while presenting at the same time. Be assisted. So again, have that co-producer available. See if you can, if you have the ability to get someone in there to help you manage some of the dynamic things that are happening in, um, in these presentations. And be specific. So um, instead of just generally saying, does anyone have a question? You can be more specific and pointed and you can say, do you have a, any questions about any of the physical surroundings uh, and presentation styles that we've just gone over? To be even more specific, you could say, does anyone have a question about anything that's on this slide? Uh, better yet, I like to frame it like, what questions do you have? So you're not giving people an out to just sit there and not ask their question. Everyone has questions. It's just a matter of getting those questions out of your audience. And as a capable and competent presenter, it really is on us to figure out how we can get that information out of our audience. So does anyone have any questions about, or ask me a question about how you might stand or be prepared or be assisted in your upcoming presentation? And feel free to answer that. Does anyone have an upcoming presentation where they can see themselves? This is even more specific. Does anyone have an upcoming presentation where any of these ideas that we've discussed thus far, where they might apply to your presentation and something that you may utilize? Grand Slam, okay. The Grand Slam is where you, uh, the Rebel Grand Slam, where you present your um, thesis and prospectus projects. Yeah, awesome. Great. Is there any techniques or any ideas that we've talked about today that you might utilize for your Grand Slam now that it's virtual? 
I'm really trying to take in the parts about the slide because we have to have one slide that kind of is minimal, but gets your point across. Yeah. And so even though I know what I want to talk about, I'm struggling with getting my point across kind of in pictures and minimal words. Sure. Yeah. So that's going to be um, the, the thing that comes last. So you think about your material and if you, you if you literally have one slide, you've got to think about what is most important in your like, what's your big idea in the presentation, right? What's your big idea? What do you want your audience to know when you're done presenting? So ask that question, think about the answer, and then look at your presentation and determine where in your presentation you really could use that assistance in clarifying that one big takeaway, that one big idea from your presentation and make that one slide all about that idea, all about that topic. What do I really want them to know when I sit down? And, and just highlight that very simply. Great question. Um, other questions, please. What questions do you have? Looks like we have a question in the chat. Is there a place I can find a template for forming a good outline? Well, in COM 101, we have a bunch of templates. Um, and I know it's a 100 level course and the folks here are masters and PhD level, but I'll tell you, it is a, it's a fail-proof way of organizing your ideas. I would be happy to share a general um, outline with everyone after this is over, for sure. You wanna think about, um, the outline won't tell you exactly like the strategy or the organizational pattern for uh, organizing your ideas in the body of your, of your talk. So so you want to think through why am I presenting the information in the sequence that I'm presenting it, right? What's the rationale for why I talk about this main point first versus this main point second versus this main point third? And really, I, did, I advise all of you to never have more than three main points in your presentation, um, what, no matter how long it is, if it's an hour or if it's five minutes. You should never have more than three main points. Um, if you have less time, think about less main points for sure. Um, but also think about how you rationalize the way you organize your information in the body. And recall that the introduction is there to introduce the body and the conclusion is there to conclude the body. Again, we're writing for the ear. It's highly repetitious, highly organized. We wanna be sure when we go to sit down um, or close our laptops that everyone knows exactly what we were trying to say and you achieve that through that really highly organized information. But yes, I'd be, I would be happy to uh, share an outline. A great, uh, Serena, a great way, a great takeaway is creating an outline first and a slide second. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Create the outline first and run through it as a, as a practice and then create your visual aid or your slides. If you have a trusted friend or a mentor or, or a, a peer, present to your peer and then ask them, what were the places that were complex or maybe a little dry? And then those are the places where you employ your visual aid. Don't ever let your visual aid lead your presentation. You and your ideas lead the presentation. Uh, like any upcoming tips for group presentations from Marlena? Um, so, yes, you want to be sure that you um, assign rules and roles in the group. You clearly assign who's doing what. You have that conversation up front. You have someone who can help lead and delegate. You have someone who can sort of like write out the outlines. You have someone who's good at creating visual aids. So you find people's strengths, you delegate to them, and then you practice a lot together online. You want to record yourself while you're practicing. You should also back and watch it individually and as a group, strategize and pivot as necessary and redo it in the places uh, and redo things in the places that didn't work out so well. So it just takes a lot of time working together, finding those ways to communicate through those channels um, and having, having a working system and establishing rules and rules. You're so welcome. Any other questions? 
No? Okay. So the last main point talks about being synchronized. So transitions are critical. So whether you're verbally transitioning through sections or ideas, you want to think about how you can review what you just said and preview where you're going. Um, in terms of transitions online from section to section, from slide to slide, how you employ the visual aid, you want to be sure that your visual aid is always sort of synchronized with what you're saying verbally. So if I had my slide from, you know, if I had my slide from like two, three slides ago and I had verbally moved on, cognitively the audience is trying to figure out, well, what am I looking at and why hasn't your visual aid caught up to where you're at now? And a good way of doing this is to use a, a blank slide in between content slides. So what you're looking at here, this is a content slide. Um, I could put blank slides, meaning just a black slide in between my content slides and go to that slide um, to help signify transitions between ideas or to let myself speak and I don't have an, an old idea hanging around and hanging up um, from what I just said to, to where I'm going. So try to be synchronized. Again, it just takes practice to be synchronized. That is the only remedy for being synchronized. Okay, so more about physical surroundings and uh, presentations. You want to be sure that you arrive early. That is in person or virtually. You want to be sure that you have a good connection. That you can troubleshoot anything that may go wrong. A good rule of thumb if you're presenting is to be there 15 minutes early. Um, be connected. So um, imagine your audience, even though you cannot see them. Imagine that they are all in that camera or it's someone that you really like or you love in that camera. And try to be connected to your audience, even though it may feel like they're just little window panes in the screen. I mean, try to imagine your audience is there and try to connect to them. Okay, so engaging your audience on virtual platforms can be hard um, because sometimes you feel like you're just speaking into the abyss. But wouldn't it be great if you had this uh, picture here as your audience and you had everyone sort of engaged and happy with the material? So that's what we're trying to get at with our um, managing virtual presentations. So increase your visibility, meaning make sure that your face is on there, right? So make sure your audience can see your face. Sometimes with technological platforms, you can just speak over a PowerPoint, that's not as effective as seeing a human being's face, the human being who's speaking to you. We like to engage with human beings' faces. We like to engage with human beings' eye contact. So make sure that you are increasing your, uh, uh, your uh, visibility there. So leverage your voice. Think about how you can use vocalics and rate uh, and enthusiasm, how you can really make your voice mirror what you want your content to be communicating. Uh, make sure that you um, understand your strengths and weaknesses in terms of verbal delivery. You know, do you use filler words? If you use filler words or vocalized pauses such as ums, likes, or, or so, try to practice your way out of that and try to simply make your speech rate slower or just pause and don't say anything instead of filling that time with unnecessary words. Embrace the pause. We talked about this a lot. So embrace that uncomfortable silence. Use pauses to highlight important information. The pause is your friend. No need to be afraid of it. No need to be intimidated by it. And start on time. We really have an obligation uh, as speakers to uh, respect people's time. So you want to start on time. Sometimes there's a lag because people are getting on. So what can you do in the instances where you want to start on time, but you know people are still trickling, trickling in virtually? You can ask a sort of like softball question. That question should be geared towards your material and your ideas, but it shouldn't necessarily give anything away in your presentation. So you can have that engagement until you're ready to start maybe five minutes after the real start time. And plan your interaction. So plan, if you don't plan for it, it's not likely that you will achieve it in your presentation. So plan the interaction with your audiences, plan those places where you check in either with your co-producer, your co-host, co um, or those um, open-ended questions that you're gonna ask. Plan that into your preparation outline and even plan that into your slides and you will have success. Uh, visually reinforce your key points by utilizing that visual aid or the slides to help create that interest or understanding. 
Make sure that you're paring down your slides. Um, always keep editing, 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 and really trying to get very, very simple on your slides. Again, we just simply cannot listen and read at the same time as humans. And then use the purposeful movement. So again, this goes back to practicing and planning your gestures. You need to do that for effective nonverbal delivery, especially online. So plan those out, practice with them, record yourself with some hand motions, with some um, you know, nonverbals in terms of the eye contact or the smile, and make sure that it's always appropriate and matching the content that you're speaking about and end on time. And the way that you end on time is practicing. You have to practice and you have to time yourself to make sure that you fit into that time frame. You can have the greatest presentation in the world, but if it's too short or if it's too long, you're going to lose your audience and everyone's going to feel a little, you know, weird about it. If you have an hour and you're carrying on for an hour and a half, your audience is going to be mad probably or having to leave. So practice and time yourself. And remember that as a speaker, you have an obligation to uh, be on time and respect those time constraints of your audience. Questions, ask me a question. What questions do you have? Well, y'all have hung in there with me for 55 minutes and I appreciate it. So to review, we talked a bit about understanding protocols and etiquette that will help you manage virtual communication. Uh, we obtained some tips to improve the quality of your physical surroundings and your presentation style. And we learned how to engage our audience in that virtual platform instead of just being passive, actually engaging with them. So I hope that was really helpful. Um, you can find me at my email here. Uh, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And if you want help with a big presentation, I totally love this stuff and I'm willing to help. Um, so that's where you can find me. And again, I will send out that outline uh, template. I will send out my outline for today with all the more detailed information of what I spoke about. And I will also uh, provide you with my PowerPoint. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, Sarah, uh, for sharing your time with us today. This was a very informative workshop on a very timely topic for all of us, whether we're just presenting in school or at work. Uh, we're all in the same virtual world. Um, so thank you again. I hope everyone That's has wonderful. a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you at the next workshop. Thank you all. Thank you everyone. Take care.